Alleluia! Christ is risen! The Lord is risen indeed! Alleluia! If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Join now together in Christ our Passover. Alleluia. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia.
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our first reading comes from the Acts of the Apostles. When the apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come again in the same way as you saw him come into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second reading comes from the first letter of Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary the devil prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of John. John looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that, I, that you gave me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, 
and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. We find ourselves in a liminal space in the church calendar, that is, a space of transition. Today is the seventh Sunday of Eastertide. Next week, we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, which begins ordinary time. It's also Ascension Sunday, which marks the first half of a two-part movement. First, Jesus ascends, and next, the Spirit descends. We find ourselves in a liminal space outside the calendar of the Church as well. Some are arguing for and acting out an aggressive reopening of business, social events, and community gatherings, while others are pushing back in the name of health and safety concerns over worries that too rapid a reopening will result in many more deaths from this pandemic. These decisions and actions are made not only with medical, scientific, and economic factors in mind, but are also involve our emotions, peer influence, and even, consciously or not, theologies that shape our values and priorities. Last week, I read a column in the Washington Post arguing that underlying the strong pro-opening sediment of the, of the white evangelical Christian subculture in America, according to a number of polls, is a core theological belief that is derived from certain interpretations of scripture passages like that in our Gospel according to John reading today. I hope that exploring this un may help us to understand how seemingly abstract teachings shape the world around us and have dramatic real-world consequences, and I hope that maybe we can find some alternatives to this today. Jesus' speech in the reading is complex and repetitive at the same time. While recording, Deacon Al remarked, this is a hard passage to read, and he's right. I was very happy for him to do the honors. The language here is deceptively simple, but the context and use is rooted in a cultural and religious context that is hard for us to approach. Now, the way that John tells the story throughout his gospel is much more dualistic, emphasizing contrast between two extremes than the other gospel writers. And you can see this from the very beginning with the beginning of light versus dark. Here, the contrast is between the phrases eternal life in the first paragraph and the world in the second. From this passage, it's easy to see how one of the cornerstones of evangelical theology has been formed and reinforced. Both inside and outside groups have identified four statements that define what we call modern evangelicalism. And the fourth is, only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. The Post columnist I read argues with seeming approval, that this literal belief in eternal salvation, eternal life, helps explain the different reactions to life-threatening events like a coronavirus outbreak. Evangelical theology, as much conventional Western Christianity has long agreed to at least some degree, is crafted around the assumption that very little here on earth matters. It's all about what happens after you die. And so there is a fatalistic and physical world-denying strand of thought here buried in much of conservative Christian theology, which sometimes is unfortunately borne out in tendencies for, say, missionary work to focus on conversion for heaven 
over relieving poverty, hunger, or sickness on earth. One influential preacher in the evangelical tradition employs an analogy in which he holds up the end of a long white rope, similar to this one. So let's imagine I'm doing this analogy, and what I would do is I would hold this up and say, look, this rope stretches out infinitely this way. And the length that stretches out here is picturing the Christian's eternal, everlasting existence in heaven after death. But then he points to a single bit of the end of the rope he's holding, and he says, now this bit here, that would be symbolizing the amount of time that you live on earth. How should you value it in contrast to all the rest of this rope? For this system, what matters most is spending the colored portion of your life on earth in such a way as to obtain the white portion in heaven, regardless of how long, fulfilling, or other serving your time on earth might be. So I think if we see this analogy, we can see how it's clear that a theology emphasizing the afterlife to such exclusion to this life now can have a tendency to underpin an ideology and actions which may deliberately devalue suffering and precautions in our communities, even with the best of intentions. Now, of course, it doesn't always happen this way, and there are many evangelical Christians who do wonderful work while holding this view. But the underlying force here does directly drive some deeply problematic actions and teachings by some others. Now, when we read Jesus' words in chapter 17, it seems like he's making this same contrast. Eternal life is opposed to, set against the world. And God is identified with the former and against the latter. Now, associating this contrast with that of the evangelical system that I just outlined is a traditional reading of this passage. And if this is working for you, if it is bearing out good fruit in your life, I'm not going to try to change your mind. However, I think for some of us, we might find value in considering an alternative way to read the passage. And I can attest to this personally as this being a very valuable part of my transition and my rebirth and my faith from moving from an evangelical background into a mainline theological tradition. So what I want to suggest is that our translators, in an effort to keep our readings familiar and approachable, have possibly done us a disservice by hiding some of the nuance and context in the Greek. And so once again, I want to dig a little deeper without trying to go too academic here. Fortunately, the original language here is surprisingly familiar. For eternal life, the Greek reads Aeonius zo. Here, zo means life, and aeonius is the adjective for, adjective form of age. The English equivalent is eon, or eonic. That is an eon or an age or an era. And for the world, we find in Greek cosmos with a K. Our English cosmos with a C is the equivalent term. So more literally, more concretely with the language, we have a contrast between something called the age of life and the ordered universe. But to understand these in their time, we also need to know how ancient Judaism thought about reality. So Judaism has long made a distinction between this age and the age to come. This predates Christianity. It predates the time of Jesus. He was born into this worldview. Unlike the dualistic worldview of influential Western thinkers such as the Greek philosopher Plato, who used Eon to describe an eternal world of ideals behind the temporal perceived um, world of the cosmos, 
the two ages in Judaism were both firmly of this same reality that we live in. They were separated only by the lack of versus the presence of the realized intention of God in justice, peace, and healing. Modern Judaism talks about this in the sense of tekum olam, the healing, repairing, establishing of the world. The sense is not used exclusive of afterlife teachings, but its focus is entirely on the incoming of God to make all things right here on this earth. In this way, John's eternal life is equivalent with the other gospel writers talking of the kingdom of God, that Jesus taught us to pray that God would bring from heaven to earth, not us in reverse. Looking again at our passage, we find that Jesus has helpfully provided a definition that can be easy to miss. In verse 3, we find this. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What we see here is that Jesus' definition of Aonius Zo is not about place, but about relationship. It's about quality, not quantity. About depth, not solely continuance. More specifically, it's about knowing in that deep and intimate sense of belonging to God and God's Messiah. One public theologian I know has described the contrast as the life of the ages versus life as people are living it these days. That Jesus is talking about an extraordinary life to the full centered in a relationship with God. One of our own conservative Anglican bishops has described the contrast between Aeonius Zo and Cosmos as not rescuing people out of the world, but rescuing the world itself, people included, from its present state of decay and corruption. As for the Cosmos, in the ancient world, world the word included not just that described by physics, as it often is thought of today, but also what we talk about as sociology and politics and religion, of the systems that we live within, the social contracts we've made, the negotiations between scarcity and abundance, cooperation and competition. Another theologian has suggested we can understand how this term is used negatively in the New Testament in the sense of domination system, as Paul refers in other places to not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers that we struggle against. In this interpretation, Jesus seems to be saying that his followers, who always lag a step behind in seeing the truth in John's gospel, are still of the system of the cosmos in a way that he no longer is. And he is praying that the Father will bring them into unity as he and the Father are in unity, in Aeonius Zo. Now, it would be easy, I admit, to dismiss this whole thing as too complicated, too esoteric, too academic to really matter in the real world. In fact, I struggled a lot with this sermon, trying to keep it from becoming an academic lecture. You'll have to tell me whether I succeeded or not. But I hope you can see how this discussion has a direct connection to our values and our priorities in our lives and communities. What if we understood Jesus as not offering escape, but integration? What if the Christian's primary values remained as earthy as Judaism's, rather than as otherworldly as Plato's sometimes were? I'd like to suggest that the Christian path might be most clearly understood as a narrow route between an exuberantly self-centered consumerism that sees this cosmos's values as ultimate and a fatalistic, self-centered hyper-spiritualism 
that denies the value of the world and people around us on the other side. Either extreme becomes a constant temptation for groups within any and all religions throughout history, and even those outside traditional religion have the same susceptibility. It doesn't reply only to the example of American evangelicalism that I've referenced in this example. This narrow path does not give us room to risk the lives of others because they'll just go to heaven when they die. It calls us to question the mantra that the economy requires lives to be sacrificed to it. The path reverses the order. The people are not made for the benefit of the system, the cosmos. The system itself is to be remade, the eon, for the benefit of the people. And in this way, we might look again at the story of the ascension in Acts and see the rebuke of the disciples in a different light that the path of the Christian is not to stand fixated on the heavens, but to set out into the cosmos for healing and renewing in confidence that to the very extent they do so, Jesus is present and working among us all. And so may we pray, as Jesus taught us, our Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. Amen. Let us join now in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us, and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. Lord God, 
Almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we might not fall into sin, nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us offer our prayers in the name of Jesus, who dwelt among us, died and rose again for our salvation, and ascended into the heavenly realm, responding, Hear us, ascended Lord, that we may place our lives in the sacred heart of Jesus, who claims us as his own and reveals his glory through our lives. Let us pray. Hear us, ascended Lord, that our hands may feed the poor and tend the sick, that we may create a church where all are welcomed and where visitors are seen as blessings, and that we may ascend beyond earthly hesitations to grasp the divine inspiration that is implanted within us. Let us pray. Hear us, ascended Lord. For those who fear the discovery of secret sins and the private guilt that has many names, that they may have confidence in the priestly gift of reconciliation, the courage to admit their shortcomings, and the greater courage to accept God's tender forgiveness. Let us pray. Hear us, ascended Lord. For an end to violence and abuse, and to all things that harm God's creation and rob humanity of its inherent dignity. Let us pray. Hear Hear us, us, ascended Lord. Lord. That Donald, our president, members of Congress, and those who sit on the Supreme Court may take seriously the authority invested in them, leaving partisanship behind and exercising leadership that best responds to the people of our nation and world. Let us pray. Hear us, ascended Lord. In thanksgiving for our families and friends and for the communion of saints, we continue our prayers. Praying for those on our prayer list, we pray for Tom, Lynn, Colleen, Marion, Shirley, Marty, Mason, Jay, Jerry, Lauren, Odell, Irene, Rich, Kevin, Raylan, Mike, Carrie, Alicia, Lee, Doug, Nina, Sandy, Sam, Teresa, Jeff, Hap, Kathy, Carrie, Jesse, Jennifer, Mary Frances, Amanda, Donna, Mary. For all who have died in communion of your church, and particularly Cora Horacek, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Hear Hear us, us, ascend the Lord. We also pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Mike, our bishop, John, our priest, and Al, our deacon. On the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for old St. John's in Colliers. And in our companion diocese in Columbia, we pray for the Reverend Jose William Correa Gales, Mission San San Juan Bautista. We offer then additional prayers at this time, either silently or aloud. We pray for all those in this pandemic who have faced loss of relationships, of social gatherings, of income, of health, of loved ones. Give them your peace and provision. Strengthen us to be the hands 
in this world, bringing your comfort to others. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us join now in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness 
to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you in the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's time to recognize birthdays and anniversaries for this coming week in the church. We celebrate a number of birthdays today, that of Martin, Kevin, Marty, and Miles. Let's join together now in the birthday prayer. Gracious God, as we rejoice in the birthdays of these your children, we pray that the year ahead will be one of blessing and peace, and that the year will bring continual joy in the knowledge of your steadfast grace and love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so announcements for this week. Once again, we find ourselves in the same pattern. So, uh, continue to remind you that we have our 9 o'clock discussion group um, every Sunday morning, then our 10 o'clock morning prayer that you're watching now, and our 11 o'clock virtual coffee hour where a number of us gather over Zoom and simply have some conversation and share what's going on in our lives. We will again have the family night prayer led by Catherine Sachs, um, a part of the Diocesan Children's Ministry program, and that will be at 7 o'clock tonight and every Sunday evening um, for, the, for this time, uh, indefinite schedule for that. Continuing on, we still have our Tuesday and Thursday evening prayers on live on YouTube. And those are the primary um, programs that we have running right now. As far as the parish uh, closure and reopening conversation, we have begun having some meetings about this as a vestry and as some committees made up of those with expertise in this area. While the bishop is allowing, well, without requiring, parishes to open beginning next week, We've decided that this is not um, the safe time for us to open yet. We still have some work to do to prepare for reopening and still have some planning to do. So at this point, we are continuing our planning work. We will be sending out a survey over the next week so that you can um, contribute your voice to what you think might be a good, um, a good fit and a good plan going forward. And we will collect that plus the other committees and groups in order to come up with a plan that we'll publish, hopefully in the next week or two, uh, we will start giving you more details of what we're thinking as far as safely regathering in different ways. If you have any specific questions, please feel free to email or call. Um, you have the information for that. And once again, if there's any need for um, spiritual direction, um, pastoral counseling, anything that you need, that you would just like to talk to myself, please feel free to reach out uh, to do a video call or to call my cell phone and I would be happy to help you. And now, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.